Thanks to all for, uh, for joining this evening. I'm Mark Nonestide, Middlesex County historian. Uh, and this talk is titled Scattered, Scattered Piles of Wreckage, a Maritime Legacy of Middlesex County. Uh, I first wanna start by um, acknowledging and recognizing the folks who have uh, helped bring this information together. Um, this is certainly a team effort and I wanna start right off the bat with, um, with recognizing uh, the folks who have helped immensely. Um, uh, with this subject. In 1908, a Sanborn fire insurance map of Perth Amboy, New Jersey, noted the property of John Gregory, who operated a local marine salvage company. The surveyor of his property noted scattered piles of wreckage about the yard, presumably from the vessels he was dismantling. Now for the people of Middlesex County, who lived and were familiar with the banks of the Raritan River and Raritan Bay, uh, scattered piles of wreckage were not unusual. Uh, this painting by James Crawford Tom, uh, an American artist born in New York in 1835, uh, who um, uh, for a time lived in um, the uh, East Brunswick Old Bridge uh, area, um, and then the last years of his life lived in the Atlantic Highlands. Uh, it shows children playing on the sand dunes of presumably, um, this would have been his period, uh, 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 in Middlesex County or in the Atlantic Highlands of, uh, of uh, Raritan Bay. Um, and if we zoom in on some of the details here, we can see this wonderful image of these children pulling a cart up one of the dunes. Uh, and Tom was also known for uh, using the likeness of his own children in his painting. But off to the left, uh, we can see what looks like um, some remnants or scattered piles of wreckage uh, noted in his painting. The importance of the navigable watercourses to the early residents of the county uh, can be traced all the way back to the earliest inhabitants. Uh, native people certainly used the water for a host of resources, and the earliest settlers purchased properly, property along the watercourses as well. Uh, this map by surveyor John Reed was done about 1685, and some of the features here are recognizable today. Uh, down on the bottom, we can see uh, Raritan Bay, Staten Island uh, and uh, Perth, uh, Perth Amboy is noted as well. Uh, meandering through the center of the screen is the Raritan River. And we can see the other water courses that feed into it, the Millstone River towards the top uh, and the South River about middle way down um, on, the, uh, on the screen. The map also shows what the early settlers valued. And it was the, not only the importance of land but the access to water, especially to move um, products. Um, it was much easier for the settlers to move and transport goods uh, to the larger markets that, um, through uh, means of water transport than through overland uh, routes at this time. Um, and that's certainly evident by where the, the earliest property is located in the county. The communities that would spring up along uh, in Middlesex County along the water course is also valued uh, that as well. And the official seals of many of these communities pay homage to ships and water transportation. Uh, if we look at the top left, we can see the seal for the, um, uh, the, the city of New Brunswick. Uh, and on the right hand part of the, uh, the shield, you can make out the sail of a sailing vessel. Uh, for the township of Woodbridge, uh, we can see that the helm, the steering wheel of a vessel on the lower part of the shield. Uh, for, for Perth Amboy on the top right, we have a very large three-masted, um, probably ocean-going uh, sailing vessel. Uh, and then in Latin, the word portus optimus, uh, the, meaning the greatest port. Uh, for the city of South Amboy on the lower left, we can see the Great Beds Lighthouse, which marked great oyster beds in Raritan Bay. Uh, for the township of Old Bridge on the upper left of the shield, we can also see a large uh, sailing vessel uh, as well. And um, my favorite, uh, South River, uh, incorporated as a borough in the 1890s, uh, we can see um, a, a vessel of some sort on the right hand side of the, um, of the, uh, the, the shield. Uh, maybe it's a brick barge, I'm not sure, uh, for the Sayre and Fisher Brick Company, but the the, the saying there is, uh, is, uh, is wonderful. Our flowing tides can carry cargoes to the markets of the world. And certainly uh, in the 1890s, uh, I'm sure it did. It's probably less so today. 
His work records from the period also reinforce the importance of shipping. Uh, this plan of the city of New Brunswick from 1829, and this is just the title part of that plan, uh, used a, a cargo schooner, um, a type of sailing vessel uh, that was common to the waterways throughout Middlesex County that carried produce and good for the larger markets and coastal uh, communities. Uh, what I love about the, you can see the coastal schooner there in, in the cartouche. Uh, on the bottom, uh, the, uh, the ways of packaging the goods they were transporting. There's a barrel and a crate. Um, and then on the top, uh, you see some wheat seeds, um, find some of the types of cargo that were carried uh, in these vessels. This is an item that we have in our uh, museum collection. Uh, and it's, it's a, a criminal document, um, a bill of lading that's dated 1773 for a shipment of about a thousand gallons of Jamaica spirits uh, from Newport, Rhode Island to New Brunswick aboard the sloop uh, Lily. Uh, and what's, um, you know, what's fascinating about it too is if you look in the margin, uh, you can see the mark that was placed on the barrels. And so when these goods arrived from uh, Newport to New Brunswick, uh, they could take this bill of lading and check it against the cargo uh, that was being shipped in to make sure uh, nobody absconded with uh, some Jamaica spirit. This pencil sketch by Archibald Robertson of the New Brunswick waterfront in the 1790s shows dark uh, docks and wharves with sailing vessels and warehouses. The use, of, the use of coastal sloops, which were single-masted uh, uh, vessels, and larger schooners, often two-masted sailing vessels, were common sites along the Raritan River and Raritan Bay. Larger square-rigged vessels were also popular for transatlantic trade and longer voyages. Uh, this example here is receiving uh, repairs at the Perth Amboy Dry Dock Company uh, in Perth Amboy. In the 18th century, transatlantic trade had to come into a recognized port of entry. And in central New Jersey, that was Perth Amboy, uh, where there was a custom officials who could, who could collect uh, taxes on the imported goods. So if you were coming across the Atlantic on a vessel and you went to South Amboy, you were probably going there to smuggle things into the region uh, to bypass the, uh, the tariffs placed by the, uh, the port officials at Perth Amboy. Some of the largest sailing vessels ever built could also be found in Raritan Bay and also along the Arthur Kill. They were New England coal schooners. Uh, most of them were built in Maine and uh, the largest were built in Maine. They had four, five, and upwards of six masts. They were enormous wooden vessels. And they could be found in the coal facilities of Port Reading, uh, the Lehigh Valley coal docks in Perth Amboy, and uh, the coal docks in South Amboy as well. Uh, this is an image not in um, Middlesex County. This is the coaling facility in Norfolk, Virginia. But it shows a six-masted, six-masted, a coal schooner uh, uh, identical to the ones that would have been found in uh, Raritan Bay and up along the Arthur Hill. Now steam gradually replaced sail in the Raritan Valley. Some of the earliest steamboats plied the waters of uh, Middlesex County between uh, New Brunswick and uh, New York. Uh, service commenced there as early as 1806. Uh, this is uh, the steamboat landing in South Amboy from uh, 1854, where connections could be made to the Camden and Amboy Railroad for travel south to Philadelphia. Steamboats were popular for excursions. They were often chartered by church groups or factories um, as a way to get their members out of the, the heat and um, uh, excursions to uh, uh, waterside amusement parks as well. Uh, they also carried cargo. Uh, this is the steamboat New Brunswick, docked in New Brunswick, which uh, met a disastrous end by fire in 1902. This, this image from Barber and Howes, a historical collection of the state of New Jersey, published in 1844, 
shows New Brunswick with the Delaware and Raritan Canal. In the background, you can see a canal bar barge being towed along by a mule or two mules. Um, and often the front of the can canal barges were rounded so that if two came from opposing positions on the canal in a tight quarter, uh, they wouldn't get bound up. They could sort of bounce off of uh, one another and keep on their way. Uh, canal barges were common vessel types clearly in the canals, but also out in the Raritan River and Raritan Bay. This is the types that we're often familiar with, uh, larger sort of squared off on the front uh, barges. Um, and they carried all kinds of goods. Uh, for Middlesex County, that included things like foundry sand, clay, and coal. They're found in the greatest numbers throughout the waterways of this region. Uh, insurance requirements often dictated that a master be on board when under tow. And as a result, uh, sometimes there was a cabin on board for these live aboard uh, masters. Um, and uh, in some cases, the companies also encouraged families to stay on board as well. Uh, they felt that that would provide stable employment. Uh, they were often strung along in a line uh, with other barges and then, and then pulled by a steam powered tugboat to the various uh, facilities or docks where they were bringing those goods to. Um, this example of a wooden barge was made in Perth Amboy at the Perth Amboy Dry Dock Company in 1914 for the Lehigh Valley the Railroad. It's a covered barge. Um, you know, some of these were open to load in coal or, or sand or, or whatever. Um, but this one most likely ca carried important cargo that needed protection and security. Um, it's one of the last of its type, and it's currently part of the collection of the Red Hook Waterfront Museum in Brooklyn. Smaller vessels were also common, and one of the most ubiquitous vessel types from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s was the Cadpo. And this is an image of Smith, Smith Creek in Sea Warren, which shows one such vessel up, up towards the front. Um, they often had a mast that was set near or in the bow. They had a large um, single sail, and they were often half the width of the, um, uh, of the length. So if the cat boat was 20 feet long, uh, it would be the beam of it, the width of it would be uh, about 10 feet wide. Um, so they're, 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 they're these ra rather like beamy vessels. You can see that in the, uh, in the image there. Um, Within folks that have studied these vessels, there's some debate about where they've originated, whether it's the New England states or uh, other regions as well. Um, they most likely come out of the, uh, the, the New York, New Jersey Harbor region uh, and, and also the Great South Bay of, of Long Island. You know, and clearly Raritan Bay would have been within the, the cradle of cat boat uh, development. Um, they had a variety of uses from fishing to clamming, oystering, transportation, uh, transportation, uh, racing, and recreational uses as well. They were immortalized in Winslow Homer's painting, Breezing Up, of a Gloucester, Massachusetts cat boat, uh, painted about 1875. One such example of a cat boat happens to be in our, our uh, county museum collection. It's the appropriately named Catboat Kitty. This is an image of it um, from the 1920s. It was built in Perth Amboy in 1875. Uh, and you can see again, some of those catboat characteristics, the mast set very forward uh, it, towards the bow and this very large um, single sail. Uh, they were built in such a way that they could be handled by a solo sailor, uh, which was part of their, uh, part of their appeal. Um, uh, this is a later image of it from the 1950s or early 60s uh, up on land on the hard. And uh, it has the characteristics of a, uh, of a great South Bay um, uh, cat boat. Uh, and that seems to what, have, what has influenced uh, its style. We first became aware of this after reviewing a survey that was done in the 1980s of um, of, uh, of uh, historic vessels in Ocean County. Uh, it's a phenomenal survey where the surveyor went to various marinas looking for historic wooden vessels. And they cataloged uh, an immense number of them. And right in the introduction of the report, it says that the oldest vessel we've found is the Catboat Kitty, uh, which was built in Perth Amboy in 1875. 
so uh, here, this was 40 years ago. So here we set about trying to find it. We tracked down the original owner from the time the survey was taken, uh, who had since sold it. And so through a, a, a research, we found out who owned it. Uh, we went down to take a look at it. This is um, what it looked like, uh, looked like today when we took a look at it. Um, it's been uh, uh, coated in fiberglass, which is both, um, uh, you know, in some ways uh, uh, detracted from it, but also has preserved it. Um, and it's amazing it survives, period. Uh, during Hurricane Sandy, the boat floated away. The owner pretty much lost it. Uh, he sent a friend up in a small airplane to try and locate it, and they found it two and a half miles away, uh, beached in some marsh. And he went over, uh, grabbed it, towed it back um, to his property, um, and there it sat until we, uh, we came and took a look at it. We spoke with the owner, and he ended up donating it uh, to Middlesex County. It's a fabulous uh, artifact from the time period. Uh, this is an interior image of it inside the cabin area. If you look at the center, that curved piece of wood that goes around is called the combing. And some historians that we've spoke to have looked at this, um, have suggested that the cabin um, is uh, removable. Uh, and uh, that was common with um, some of these cat boats where that could be removed for the different uses and different purposes of them. Uh, it has a lot of original fabric. Um, again, you can see that more on the inside, uh, although the wooden planking and the ribbing and uh, as well as um, many parts, uh, the, the windows, uh, and just towards the top there, you can see the mahogany tiller uh, as well. So we are uh, developing a preservation plan for this so that we can interpret it and put this on, uh, on display um, and help, again, interpret the history of uh, uh, these types of vessels uh, in uh, Middlesex County. Um, I do want to give a shout out to the Cat Boat Association. Uh, this is a community of cat boat enthusiasts who sail today um, modern versions, fiberglass versions of cat boats, as well as folks um, who have restored the, the um, old wooden ones um, and, um, and who sell them uh, as well. Uh, it's a, a wonderful group of individuals who are very enthusiastic about these, uh, these types of vessels, um, including a gentleman named Gary Sherman, um, who has built a replica of, of Una, which was an 1852 cat boat built by uh, Robert Fish uh, in Jersey City. And um, he is one of the, in the historic records, one of the earliest uh, that's associated with cat boat building in the New York Harbor region. Um, and uh, this gentleman uh, built a replica of, uh, of um, Una, one of these early cat boats that was built by uh, Bob Fish in 1852. Um, so a, a wonderful group of people. The contributor of the maritime history of Middlesex County was John H. Gregory. Uh, Mr. Gregory was the owner of a maritime salvage yard in Perth Amboy. He was born on September 16, 1862 in Sag Harbor, Long Island. When he was 16 years old, he moved to Red Bank, New Jersey, and began his interest in the wrecking trade. In 1888, he moved to Perth Amboy, and his business was located at the head of Brighton Avenue. And with a growing collection of decrepit ships, his yard quickly became known as Gregory's Graveyard. It is his yard that was noted in 1908, those scattered piles of wreckage. Now, the Library of Congress, and I, I have the link up there at the top, has three images that are titled a, um, a uh, boat graveyard uh, as being noted. It says boat graveyard or uh, boats to rot away New York City. Uh, I believe these three images are mislabeled and that these are actually Gregory's uh, graveyard in Perth Amboy. Every one of these vessels that we're, that we're about to see, uh, where, where we can discern the names on them, have all been documented through um, records as being in Perth Amboy. And there are some landmarks in these uh, images, including the, um, the Raritan train bridge, which is now the New Jersey coastline. Uh, you can see that train bridge uh, in the background. Um, and these are wonderful. You can go to the site, you can download these uh, in, in a, all sorts of formats, including a, um, a TIFF and get a high resolution where you can zoom in, like almost like you're walking through uh, these vessels. And it's, it's wonderful. There's so many hidden details of workers inside and uh, um, uh, things that, are, um, that, um, uh, that you can see by only uh, downloading these large um, high resolution images. Uh, I'm gonna try and zoom in on some of this. We, we can see right up front there, the, uh, the launch Kiki, 
you see on the bow, the small launch there with the, um, the canvas canopy going around. Uh, this was documented as being in Perth Amboy um, uh, in newspaper accounts. Uh, in 1903 and 1904, um, it had some engine troubles. It was stolen at one point, and the folks who stole it stripped the engine of uh, the, its brass components, and uh, the engine was replaced. Um, there was an accident at one point with one of the operators and the engine, uh, and it may be why it's ended up here at uh, Gregory's Yard, either for repairs or dismantling. Um, that canvas covering around protected the, the open cockpit of the um, of the launch as well as where the mechanical uh, the engine was located as well. The vessel in the background, the large one on the left, is the the steamer Drew. You can make out on the bow uh, the name of it. Um, the Drew was a large uh, Hudson River, uh, well-known Hudson River a steamboat that was built in the 1860s and operated by the People's Evening Line. It ran from New York City up to uh, Albany. Um, it was a massive paddle wheel um, steamboat that uh, by 1904 had been what, 40, 50 years old and purchased by Gregory for dismantling in his yard. Uh, these are uh, some historic images also from the Library of Congress where you can see the grand uh, a saloon of the, uh, of the steamboat and the, the opulent fixtures that were part of it. And often we find in some of the, the newspaper accounts um, of Gregory and his operations that he sold off these fittings uh, in Perth Amboy and the furniture would end up in billiard halls or other locations. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, uh, would think and would what would make for a great research project at some point is like what survives of this in Perth Amboy? Are there houses uh, to this day that have pictures from some of the vessels that Gregory was dismantling? in his yard. But certainly the newspaper accounts speak to that. It'd be cool to, to kind of match that up uh, as well. Um, so this is the next image. We're kind of skirting down the yard a bit. Now we're looking head on. We see the Drew there, another uh, steamboat as well um, in the foreground. Uh, and if we zoom in, if you look right in the center, you'll see um, uh, two young rapscallions sitting on their own scattered pile of wreckage there. Uh, what they're actually sitting on are the disassembled um, framing of the paddle wheel. Uh, you can see the iron framing pieces and then where the uh, the wooden paddles would be uh, inserted into those channels. Uh, this, this is just such a great image. And then we skirt down to that, uh, that last image uh, in the background is the uh, train trestle that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, the Chancellor, um, which is off to the right, another steamboat, um, ferry boat, uh, was all, is also documented as being in Perth Amboy. Um, and again, we can see those scattered piles of wreckage that were noted in the 1980 insurance map. And here's a more detailed image. The most famous vessels that Gregory had uh, in his yard was the General Slocum. On June 15, 1904, the General Slocum caught fire and sank in the East River of New York City. At the time of the accident, she was on a chartered run carrying members of St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church uh, to a church picnic. An estimated 1,021 uh, of the 1,342 people on board died. The General Slocum disaster was New York area's worst disaster in terms of loss of life until September 11th. It's the worst maritime disaster in the city's history, and it's the second worst maritime disaster on United States waterways. Now the Slocum, what was left of it after the fire was purchased by John Gregory and brought to his uh, salvage yard. And the uh, newspapers, once they found out of this, this remarked that uh, Slocum's grave would be at Amboy at Gregory's uh, Marine graveyard. The burnt hulk of the Slocum was sold at an auction in Brooklyn on November 15th, 1904. Um, and uh, uh, it would um, arrive in Perth Amboy on the morning of November 17, 1904. Perth Amboy Public Library has a series of images of Slocum, and I tried to put them in order as I feel uh, um, they were taken. Uh, this is um, what I believe to be the, 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 the first image showing the arrival of the Slocum uh, coming um, around Staten Island into Raritan Bay. It was greeted by large crowds of people who were assembled on the shoreline to see this. Uh, you can see the the brick superstructure of the vessel, the, um, the massive framing timber. You can see the paddle wheel on the right. 
Um, at the very top of the framing piece is that triangular piece is the walking uh, beam, a steam engine. So there was, um, uh, this was powered by a steam engine that had a piston that pushed up on that uh, walking beam, which then pushed down on the crankshaft and would turn the paddle wheel. And so that, that thing at the top rocked back and forth um, as the, you know, the pistons pushing up and the other end going down, turning the crankshaft on the paddle wheel. Um, and that was a characteristic of some of these steamboats uh, from this period. The next image shows uh, it docked at Gregory's uh, graveyard. The vessel you see on the other side, that's the Drew, we saw in those earlier images. And if we zoom in on this, we can see he stripped down, the paddle wheel's gone, he stripped down parts of the superstructure. Uh, we can see where the boilers are and what may be the base of the funnels. If we go to the next image, we can see now again that, that the, the boilers are out, those funnels are out. Um, we can see the slocum there. The Drew is on the other side of the, the pier. And then we have an image taken from the deck, um, which is um, you know, uh, fascinating that somebody got up on there to, to capture these uh, images. Uh, and if we zoom in on the, this was the framing to that walking beam engine, uh, we can see some workers uh, there as well in the background. Um, but we can also see the charred lumber uh, from the, the devastating fire uh, you know, that killed so many people in this disaster. And then this is the image of the stern of the vessel, um, which uh, is sort of a poignant image. Um, the, the, the Slocum, when it caught fire, uh, uh, tried to um, uh, beach itself, I believe on Brothers Island in the East River. And the front of it uh, got stuck, but the bow was hanging off into the deep water. And the way the fire was blowing towards the stern of the vessel, uh, so many of the passengers on board uh, ended up coming to this point where they, they had to make the decision to jump overboard um, from this location. And unfortunately, uh, many of them um, drowned. The Slocum was um, sold by John Gregory to Frederick Kramer of Philadelphia for $800. Uh, in fact, the title was um, done one year later on the anniversary of the disaster on June 15, 1905. And on June 22, 1905, the Slocum left Perth Amboy bound for a Camden shipyard where it was retrofitted into a barge and renamed the Maryland. And it was a good thing that it left Gregory's graveyard. On July 5, 1905, just several days later, a devastating fire destroyed the remaining vessels that were there. But all those vessels we saw in those images, the Drew, the Chancellor, they were all burned to the waterline during that fire in 1905. Um, so was this the end of the Slocum? No, it, it finds itself back in Middlesex County um, in 1909, now as the Barge Maryland, where it was at Farley's Dock in Sayreville, picking up a load of bricks from the Sayre and Fisher Brick Company, where it was overloaded and it sunk. And of course, the papers had a field day with the unlo un unlucky Slocum uh, sinking yet again. Uh, the vessel was eventually salvaged by the Merritt Chapman Derrick and Wrecking Company, um, and it was refloated, and it lived its life as a barge um, until 1911, when it was sunk with a load of coke at Corson's Inlet, south of Atlantic City, where the wreck still lies today. Uh, it's interesting that when Gregory had the vessel, he, um, so the barge being raised at Sayreville, uh, he sold off uh, parts of the vessel, uh, including the whistle, which went to one of the local um, um, machine factories, uh, Shents and Eckerd's in Perth Amboy. And um, it was noted in um, 1905, July of 1905, uh, a steamboat excursion that had a reporter on board. Um, when they got nearby the dock, the steamboat, um, the whistle uh, let off a very eerie and long um, sound. Uh, and uh, it was not lost on uh, this reporter who stated that. Um, when some of the people heard the whistle this morning, uh, it made them shudder, reminded them of the Slocum. Now, Gregory's yard was purchased by Perth Amboy and was cleaned up in 1914. Uh, in fact, there's quite a bit of documents uh, about the, the cleanup operation. Um, uh, uh, there was a lot of back and forth with Gregory um, and the city and the requirements for cleaning up this property and what he was going to do with all these hulks. Um, these, you know, these decrepit vessels that were there. Uh, there, um, 
And, and what's fascinating in some of these documents, it shows that some of these vessels, which I had thought had been long gone and dismantled, like the Drew, were still there in 1914 uh, in some state. And um, one of the things he did with some of them is, uh, and I guess this is how you, you clean things up in 1914, he dragged what he could across Raritan Bay from Perth Amboy to the mud flats on the other side of the bay in um, what's now Sayreville. And uh, they were deposited between a point called Marsh Point, which if you can see, uh, kind of pointing with the pointer here, and the county bridge. Now, the current bridge, the Route 35 bridge, the Victory Bridge that crosses there today uh, is later. The original county bridge crossed south of that um, at about this location where I have the pointer now. So between Marsh Point, this point here, and the county bridge is where Gregory, we know, deposited some of these hulks, uh, including a steamboat. Um, and if we look at this location today, we can see a number of, of hulks um, that uh, lie uh, there to this day. And if we zoom on, zoom into them, we can see that these hulks are indeed incredible hulks. And they, um, there's a number of them there. In fact, if we count them up, there's looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, um, and possibly even more. Uh, they're quite large. They range in length, um, at least over, some of these are over about 150 feet long. Uh, so they're significant size. Uh, significant sizes. Um, they have features which may suggest use. Uh, we can see these large framing pieces uh, in them, which may be um, a centerboard um, for sailing vessels or possibly the bottom framing of where the um, those walking beam engines, those uh, framing pieces would have been sat and connected to the vessel. Um, uh, and here's another, see if I can get another image of them. Um, we have looked at these through uh, aerial photographs going back to the 1930s, and uh, they're less discernible in the 30s. Um, they seem to be covered by a tremendous amount of silt at that time. And over the last really maybe 30, 40 years, um, they've really eroded out. Uh, and it probably uh, um, the shoreline now is probably more what it was like in 1914 uh, maybe when some of the stuff was dumped over there um, than it was uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 years ago. The, um, these hulks, as well as another 134 sites, were part of a survey commissioned by Middlesex County in 2020 and uh, done by E2 um, Project Management um, and mainly by Scott Weisorek. And, and I really, I really want to give a great shout out to Scott and the work that he did uh, it was uh, inspirational for our uh, further study of some of these sites. It really laid a great foundation um, uh, for the study of, of what resources may be out there and what we can do to further uh, understand uh, those resources and document and, uh, and preserve them. So we're, we're very grateful for uh, that work that Scott, um, that Scott did. Um, and uh, uh, another site that came out in the a study is a site in South Amboy. And what's, what's curious about Sa South Amboy is a lot of the waterfront in South Amboy today has been filled in. Uh, it was drastically different um, before the early 1950s when much of the waterfront uh, in South Amboy was extended out and filled in. Uh, this is an aerial photograph from 1931, uh, which shows the historic South Amboy um, waterfront area. And if we look in the image, we can see the remnants of, uh, of a vessel here that we've identified, we believe is the Costa Rica or the Costa Rican, a large iron, iron, iron hull steamship that was beached around this location uh, in a storm, uh, we think around 1919. And today, uh, if this vessel survives, it would be buried underneath the ball field of the Alley Clark Athletic Center in South Amboy. Um, you can see the overlay, you see the vessel right there. I'm gonna pull back there. You can see uh, the 1931 aerial overlaid on a modern uh, map and then the two ball fields here. So uh, South Amboy has applied to Middlesex County for a grant to restore these ball fields. 
And we were able to work into the grant agreement an opportunity to uh, do some geophysical work to determine uh, if this uh, vessel indeed is still there. And if it is, the opportunity to try and excavate it. Um, it is noted as uh, a large, um, as large as 350 foot long uh, iron hull uh, vessel. And again, uh, uh, we think it may be the, the Costa Rica or the Costa Rican. We're still doing some additional research on it. Um, but uh, through this further research, we hope to um, identify it and uh, add again to our knowledge of it and um, uh, the history of, uh, of, um, uh, of it in Middlesex County. Uh, the, uh, this research project, the studies that have been commissioned, Again, it's an opportunity and, and the acquiring of, a, of a, an artifact, the catboat kitty, um, has been an opportunity for us with the county uh, to understand uh, its maritime history, which is an important and integral part of our, of our history. And um, again, I wanna thank uh, all of the, the folks who have helped uh, contribute knowledge um, uh, to that history and to this presentation. And again, I wanna thank the Archaeological Society of New Jersey for uh, allowing me to give this presentation. Thank you very much.